Greetings, everyone. It's a great pleasure today to come to you with yet another topic, which is a really important topic. This is a little complicated, but it's really important because this shows what we're what has been do, going on in terms of blood clot research and improving the the plight of people that get blood clots. And today we're just very excited to have Professor Jose uh, Diaz who uh, come to us, who's the director of the Division of Surgical Research at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Diaz is a vascular surgeon trained in general and cardiovascular surgery with additional specialization in ultrasonography and phlebology. Now he's internationally recognized for his contributions to surgical preclinical model development and vascular disease research. In addition, his surgical, in his surgical research, he's also very interested in vascular biology, immunology, especially inflammation, with expertise in deep venous thrombosis, aneurysms, preclinical models, and thrombosis. Wow. Overall, however, what we're talking about here is that he is involved in the next generation, the next step of improving care of the patients with thrombosis. And you're gonna hear how not today, it's not only when you get a blood clot that you take blood thinners, but also anti-inflammatory drugs are also gonna become important and anti-cholesterol drugs also important as a cocktail to improve the plight of the patients with blood clots. Now we're not quite there yet, but here is some of the cutting edge research that uh, we would like to share with you. So now, uh, I would like to introduce Jose and welcome you to our stage. Well, thank you, Dr. Caprini, for this invitation. Um, <clears throat> the title of my talk is The Curious Case of Thrombosis and Inflammation, and, I, and I'm happy to be here to talk um, to the community about this uh, subject. I don't have any, uh, to declare any conflict of interest related to this talk. So do you know what deep vein thrombosis means? So if you think in a um, body, these are um, representations of a leg, and we have basically three different uh, ven uh, venous system, um, the superficial one, the deep one, and the perforators that are veins that connect superficial with deep. Now, um, when we try to talk about deep vein thrombosis, we need to focus on the deep veins. The deep veins are those ones that circulate, you know, deep in the tissue. This is what the name is deep. And um, it's here when um, thrombus form that uh, we have this uh, clinical um, uh, setting named deep vein thrombosis or clotting in the deep veins. Now, what happened is that um, the, the, the clot formed in the deep veins, and it, this is a representation. When we see the patient, the patient leg <clears throat> looks bigger, swollen, and uh, the thrombus form in the deep veins. And there are complications that we can see in the acute phase, which is uh, named uh, pulmonary embolism. And what it is, is that uh, a little piece of the thrombus that forms in, the, in those deep veins in the legs uh, in general, you can migrate and go with the circulation. Now, it's interesting that if we think how the uh, blood circulate, uh, in the legs goes all the way up to the heart and then from the heart to the, to the lungs. And this is, this is why sometimes a little piece of the clot ended up in the lungs. Now this uh, could happen in uh, small pieces or it could be larger and that could be um, uh, problematic for, for the life. Now, if we think in a long-term complication, um, we know that uh, post-thrombotic syndrome or what we call post-thrombotic syndrome which is a long-term complication or consequence of having a deep vein thrombosis, that can occur, not in a lot of people, but when that happens, is it deteriorate the quality of life and have some uh, uh, problems like uh, ulcers and decoloration of the leg that um, <clears throat> uh, we can observe years after the uh, deep vein thrombosis episode. Now, how we can improve this? Well, what we know up today is um, that we have a lot of treatments based on the knowledge that we carry. And those treatments, I try to summarize here. I will not go in detail, but in summary, what we can say is that 
those treatments are basically what we know as a blood thinners, or we can, um, that sorry, that they can tag the, or sh shut down the coagulation system, or we can treat the thrombus itself. That sometimes we try to remove that thrombus to try to prevent that post-thrombotic syndrome. All of these alternatives are valid and we have that. <clears throat> However, we, um, we know today that coagulation system is not the only mechanism that participate in clot formation. Um, if we think in the latest investigations that we are observing, we know that coagulation is very important. And my laboratory was studying uh, for the last 10 years, other mechanisms that we believe are also important. And we can name those as inflammation and fibrinolytic system. So the fibrinolytic system is to just say it in another way, is a mechanism that try to chew the clot. And inflammation, we know inflammation when we have an infection, for example, but in this case, inflammation, it comes to play a role to probably worse when it tried to be the opposite um, in the deep vein thrombosis. And we will go in detail about that. So when we think the therapies that we have today, and I just presented in the previous slide, um, we know that we can shut down the coagulation system with the blood thinners. And we develop new uh, blood thinners lately, uh, even better. So what we have is good, but also we know that we don't do much about the fibrinolytic system and we don't do much about inflammation. So when we think if we need to improve those acute or chronic complications, maybe we should pay attention in these uh, other two mechanisms that we have a pilot. <clears throat> now, in order to try to make this um, simple, um, we need to, we can, I would like to present this as talking about inflammation and fibrinolytic system, mechanisms that we discovered in the last 10 years. And I will be trying to be not too much technical about that. So let's talk about a molecule named interleukin-6. Well, interleukin C is a mediator. It's a, it's a molecule that participates in inflammation. And what is interesting is that <clears throat> this study demonstrates that when we, you try to block that particular molecule, uh, the thrombus that we observe are, are reduced compared to those uh, that, that doesn't receive those um, uh, blockers. And um, when we think in long term, the picture on the right, you can see that blue color that on the right, is decreased compared to on the, on the left, that blue color is less. And the group that we use uh, this blocker of anti IL-6. So um, this uh, provide evidence that this molecule, which is an inflammatory mediator, uh, <clears throat> participate in the, uh, in, in the pain thrombosis. Here is the decrease of the clot, and here is the decrease of the fibrosis. Now, there are molecules named uh, nets or neutrophil extracellular traps. These are um, like a fibers, the, the fibers that are released from neutrophils, which is a cell that participate deeply in inflammation. And we examine uh, plasma in, um, in patients that have deep vein thrombosis. And guess what? We found that this uh, fiber or this plasma DNA was really increased in those patients with deep vein thrombosis. So that is another evidence that inflammation and deep vein thrombosis are linked. Let's talk about another molecule, P-selectin. P-selectin is an adhesion molecule. It's the molecule that neutrophils, when are rolling in the vein wall, uh, um, the neutrophil use the P-selectin to get attached to the vein wall and then get incorporated in the vein wall. We learn this, for example, in inflammatory conditions. However, if we observe works uh, done in, in, in the laboratory, you can see that when you try to block that molecule, the capacity of the body to um, recanalize or reopen that thrombus is huge. So somehow we are helping the body to reopen a deep vein um, or a vein with a clot 
uh, using a blocker for this molecule named piselectin. Now, another molecule, and now I'm talking about the fibrinolytic system, the system that chew the clot, um, is a molecule named uh, Pi1, which means uh, plasminogen activator inhibitor one. Now, this molecule is the molecule that regulate this system. And if that molecule um, that we observe, for example, increased in those environment with um, a lot of lipids, circulating lipids, um, we know that blocking that fibrinolytic system or that molecule named Pi1 could be important to reverse that situation and then make this system more active to choose the cloud. Now, interesting is that studies that we run um, uh, related to statins that are medication that we use on the um, this lipidemia or, or when we have high level of lipids um, demonstrate that interestingly, they have two effects is anti-inflammatory and activate that uh, fibrinolytic system. So we have evidence that it reduced the number of neutrophils in the thrombus. We have evidence that the pi one, which is the inhibitor of that two system, uh, the system that you the clot is decreased too. So in, in, in this picture, what we can see is that both are um, uh, somehow try to help to cure or to improve um, this DVT scenario for something better, for good. So we explore mechanisms here. We present why we think that this medication can have a pro-inflammatory and anti-fibrinolytic and um, pro-fibrinolytic effects. And um, this is just to summarize how complex is this picture. When we think in terms of um, deep vein thrombosis, we can see that there is an acute phase that uh, there are biological events that are happening, molecules that are activated after the other one and ended up in the chronic um, stage that I mentioned with fibrosis. Um, here is a clear picture about molecules that I just mentioned, mentioned like a IL-6, PI-1, selectin, et cetera, neutrophils. And um, I think uh, just to finalize, there are, there are evidence today that uh, factors that determine thrombus formation are not restricted only to the coagul uh, coagulation <clears throat> system only. Um, the current anticoagulation treatments are not designed to regulate the inflammatory system. The field is currently named immune throm immunothrombosis um, because we now recognize how important is inflammation in this context. And it is known that during the venous thrombosis formation, endothelial cells, platelets, leukocytes are critically active. And their role, um, we start understanding the role of, of these uh, cells, but also we detect some biomarkers associated with increased risks of venous thrombosis. So now we need to think in the future, um, probably we will pay more attention with this inflammatory uh, component in deep vein thrombosis. And I think the field will move forward. Well, we will discuss this, but it will move forward to, over to um, uh, some anti inflammatory strategies. So um, that's it. Thank you very much. And um, I really appreciate uh, your attention. Well, thank you very much. That was a, a, a brilliant lecture and a very stimulating because this is moving forward uh, in the future. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, we have all these new anticoagulants and you see all these television ads and using these anticoagulants and so forth. And, and, and this is just to tell the public, you know, that's not the answer. We can't, those anticoagulants are wonderful drugs, no question about it. But what I hear you telling us is that we have to look beyond anticoagulation. And for example, let's talk about uh, patients that, uh, isn't it now uh, more commonplace in patients to add a statin because a lot of these patients, a lot of the reasons why these patients get blood clots is they're overweight and they have all these uh, other uh, uh, diseases and comorbidities, diabetes and congestive heart failure and so forth. And all of that's associated with hyperlipidemia. So a lot of them are already candidates for statins. So uh, tell us about, the, about using the statins, not only for that, but in those patients that maybe are at high risk for bleeding. 
So <clears throat> that the, the starting concept is very important. And uh, there are studies, clinical studies that support that it can, it can help in the DBT context. Um, it's true that there are effect, effects. Um, it was a, a study published in 2009, the, the Jupiter trial. And uh, in that trial it was very interesting how um, a lot of people, the, uh, they don't develop the, the brain thrombosis that were in that trial. Um, so from the basic science and laboratories where try to understand the mechanisms and apparently they have effects that are anti-inflammatory, but also pro fibrinolytic that system that chew the clot. So imagine if you have in a context where you have this amount of inflammation and this amount of um, uh, fibrinolytic system and suddenly statins can uh, reverse that equation. So that will be probably the role of the statins. Now, it's interesting also to mention that uh, even though we have this uh, preliminary evidence, um, we need to move forward and then under understand which one will be the population that is real uh, candidate for, for this type of uh, um, uh, administration when we think in deep pain thrombosis and, and understand a little bit more if all the patients will be candidate or just, you know, some of the patients. So we, we are moving forward on that. Very promising though. So now finally, um, Jose, what, what do you feel based on all the work that you've done is going to be the next drug to make it to market as an additional therapy or a combination therapy with anticoagulation in this inflammatory thrombosis picture? Yeah, uh, I hope I can have an answer for that, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> because that would be great. Um, but uh, but definitely, if 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 the people that are working in, in developing new drugs or even um, uh, looking in old drugs that we can really um, use in the future with this purpose of uh, anti-inflammatory, for example. Um, it's good, what we are trying to put here, the word out is that coagulation is not the only mechanism. Um, what we are seeing uh, uh, that uh, it's great to have anticoagulants, it's great the treatments that we have, it's great to have uh, um, stockings and all the support that we provide to the patient. But still, there are some pulmonary embolisms that we see, there are some uh, post-thrombotic syndrome. So, why we have those, why we don't finalize everything. This is telling us, okay, there is something else. And one of the things that particularly, everything that I learned through my mentors and, 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 and in, on my own laboratory, I think inflammation play a big, big role. Well, that's really very interesting. And I'd like to uh, thank you once again, Jose, for coming aboard and uh, presenting this work to our viewers. And I'm sure that this will be a topic of interest. And I'm sure in the future, we're going to have you back uh, so that you can tell us when uh, you when that, that next new drug comes out and uh, what the ramifications are. So thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the audience for listening and uh, stay tuned uh, until the next time.